Welcome to Waterloo Methodist Church Backyard Worship. I'm Pastor Brian. Well, I'm so glad you chose to join us today, whether Facebook Live or here in person in the backyard worshiping together. We have a great day scheduled because God's going to meet with us, and it's going to be awesome. We're going to hear testimonies of those that are getting baptized today, how God has changed their heart and their lives. And uh, after service, we're going to go down to the river and do a baptism. And so today is an awesome day as we gather together. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for today. We get to join in worship together. Focus our hearts, our minds, our attitudes, our lives on you today. That we would pour ourselves out as a drink offering like Paul did. And Father, that you teach us from your word today. Be with the worship team as they lead us. As they lead us in worship to you, let us focus in on you today. Thank you for what you're going to do and how you're going to work in incredible ways because you are always working in and around us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Perry? I get joy when I think about the Lord. Can I get an amen there? Okay. Now we need the help here singing. one.
This next song is Shine, Jesus Shine. Jesus is the light. Can I get an amen? amen. Pastor Brian, so glad that you can be with us today. A couple quick announcements for you. Uh, offering is uh, the mailbox on the tree, or you can give online through the church website, wfmchurch.org, uh, or mail in a check, or the offering on the tree is the uh, offering plate for today. Uh, amazing to see the building. If you haven't noticed, sidewalks are in, and the driveway has been finished. Uh, we're just letting it cure. We can drive on it next week. Uh, windows are supposed to be here this next week, I think, and uh, they're supposed to enclose this end, the east end of the building, with steel. Uh, that's on the schedule for this week as well. So a lot of great things going on. I just want to do a shout-out. Uh, Howard came and helped me run some Internet wire the other night, and Bruce and Lori went through and cleaned, swept, and it looks amazing. So if you haven't had a chance to walk through, great time to walk through. But right after service today, we're going to run down to the river and do the baptism. So you have to come back sometime this week and do that. Uh, but join us right after service. We're going down to Mon Paz, uh, right behind the building. You drive down the hill. And uh, where the canoes come out is where there's a little area that we've done it in the past. It works out very well for baptism. We have three people getting baptized today. So join us after service uh, at Mon Paz. Right after service, we'll run down there together and do that. Hey, I just want to remind you that we're started uh, 10 o'clock prayer time here in the sanctuary. Uh, whether you want to pray outside or in the uh, sanctuary in the church or around the building, you're welcome to come and join us as we do prayer at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning as we head towards school and all the great things this fall has in store, classes and uh, small groups and Sunday school we're going to kick back off and Wednesday night programming and all those things. So a lot of things to be praying about and a lot of needs to be praying about as well. Let's do our memory verse together. I think Kim got it right in the bulletin this week. I messed up and didn't spell check it. She was always correcting me, so I missed one. So yes, everything else is worthless when comparing with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so I could gain Christ and become one with him. Philippians 3, 8 and 9. I will. 
Our God reigns. God, you reign. You're in control. You got it all figured out. You know our problems. You know our struggles. You know what's going on in our world. And you still reign. You're still in control. You still got it. We recognize that you are an awesome God, creator of heaven and earth, sending your son Jesus to die for us. And you reign over us. And we worship you because you are God. Whether we're battling a sickness or an illness, you got it. You're under. Father, we pray that you be with Nancy Quigley today as they try to figure out what's going on. She's had a little stroke and they've done some procedures as they continue to figure it out, practice medicine. But God, you're in control. You reign. Father, we pray for Howard's dad, John, as they try to figure out what's going on with his heart during this time. And thank you for my mom is in rehab and getting stronger day by day, getting up and walking. And Father, you reign. And we pray for Karen Doby's mom as she just come through heart surgery and as they're waking her up and, and bringing her back and all those things, Father. And Karen's so far away from mom. So we pray that you be with Karen today and her family. Be with Guy as they figure out what's going on with his shoulders and wrists and Rhonda's arm and Doug's foot and Tyler's foot. And the list just goes on of needs in our church family. But above all, you reign, Father. We pray for Cindy. And her family during this time of loss, that you would be with them as we celebrate James' life together. 
Father, I pray for the kids going back to school. It's just days, weeks away. And we need you so desperately in our kids' lives, in our schools, in our community. You reign. And we give it all to you. We thank and praise you for what you're going to do and how you're going to show up in some incredible ways. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the uh, exciting awesome things as a pastor is uh, being able to watch and see God work in incredible ways and uh, and one demonstration of that is baptism and so uh, part of our baptism that we'd like to do is just talk about baptism as well as uh, have people share Let me stand right here I got one. Baptism is a outward sign of what God's done in our lives. It's a transformation that takes place in our hearts and lives. And baptism is a demonstration. It's coming out and saying, I'm a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of the Lord. And it's a part of obedience because God tells us throughout his word, Jesus demonstrated. I always say baptism is one of those events in the Bible where everyone shows up. Uh, remember, Jesus was there. Obviously, he was getting baptized. Uh, the Father says with a loud voice from heaven, This is my Son, who I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descends as a dove. So everyone shows up for baptism because it's that important. So Autumn is uh, going to share a little bit about her life and her testimony and how she got to where we are today. Step up a little bit. Come on. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Don't mind the baby girl. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I didn't really follow the paper too much because it says, how was your life different before Jesus? Well, I grew up in a Christian family, went to church, went to a Christian school. So, you know, as a little person, I, you know, they were talking about hell and I was like, well, I don't want to go there. So, uh, when I was probably four or five, I accepted Jesus into my heart and then probably again at, you know, kindergarten and first grade, because you're not sure really fully how all that works. So it wasn't until about junior high, probably really understood what kind of, what that actually meant. And so kind of in high school, had some spiritual highs and spiritual lows. Uh, then I went to college and kind of got away from all the things that I was supposed to be doing during the Navy. Definitely got away from all the things I was supposed to be doing. Uh, somebody talked about talking like a sailor. I was living that sailor life and uh, people definitely would not have known that I was a Christian if they would look at how I was acting, how I was talking and all those things. Uh, so once I got married, I married a person that wasn't a Christian. So you know how that kind of goes. So my marriage was struggling. So kind of COVID happened and I quit my job, which happened to be kind of toxic because again, people at, church, or at work wouldn't have known that I was a Christian because of the way that I acted and the way I talked. Uh, so last year, once Kenny decided that he was going to get saved and started reading his Bible and all that stuff, and I was kind of like, yeah, he's going to have questions, so I should probably start doing that. <laughs> so I started reading the Bible, and my goal was to get through the Bible, because I've never read through the entire Bible. So I got about halfway there, and then, you know, a little person showed up, which you would think, he sleeps all day, that should be easy to do. No, uh, not so much. So um, that's kind of where I'm at. And my thing is, I just, I'm really trying to be a better example for my children, Amen. for one, because yeah. they need to see somebody that, you know, oh, yes, she says she's doing this, and I can tell that. So, that's kind of where I it. We were first? Oh, James 1 -8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That was something I learned back in high school, and how true is that? You can't live two different, two different worlds. Right. It doesn't work. Yeah, right. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing. Thank you. Olivia? Ken got baptized last year, if you remember, uh, and told his story. And, uh, and this is Ken's second daughter, the cutest daughter. Good morning. Olivia. He's trying to Olivia. make you embarrassed. No, go ahead. Um, well, before I came to know God, uh, I was living kind of, I would say, a careless life because I never went to church. I, I never read the Bible. I didn't even think about reading the Bible or any of that stuff. I didn't do devotions or anything. And then um, I wasn't, I don't, I wouldn't say I went, I wasn't as happy with myself. And then I came to live with my dad in Michigan because I lived in Indiana. And then Autumn, as my stepmom, mom, mom and um, so Autumn's a 
Christian. So then she introduced my dad, my sister, and I into this life. And so then the more that I went to church and then the more that I did the youth group, um, the more that I started learning about God and experiencing it, uh, the more that I knew that this was a life that I wanted to live. Amen. Amen. Um, and so, yeah. And now every morning I wake up and I do my devotions and I start off with God. I'm not perfect. I will definitely miss that. Nobody's perfect. That's right. Uh -huh. But um, I would definitely say that I've changed um, like how my perspective of life is. I just want to continue to grow with this new life. Thank you. Memory verse or verse? Okay. That's all right. Thank you. Thank for you. Thank, Thank you for sharing. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Tell me your name. Kristen. Hi, Kristen. Hi. Um, before, before God, my life was, I was living for myself. Selfish. It was full of drugs, hate, anger, depression, suicidal thoughts, attempting. I couldn't be there for my kid. I couldn't be there for my two and a half year old son. I'm going through a divorce, I'm only 24. My mom and dad, I grew up in church. My dad left. And, sorry, I don't do good with speaking in front of everybody. That's okay, you're doing good. good. Um, it was just recently that I decided to understand what, he, what God was. And it's been a struggle, it's been hard, it's been, <laughs> it's been fun. <laughs> um, so I have to do this. I have to get baptized so I can be a better spouse, a better mother for my son. And I can tell a difference. I feel, after leaving church every Sunday, I feel lighter, I feel radiant, I feel like I'm glowing. I don't feel angry, I don't feel so weighed down, I don't... <laughs> I don't feel yeah. so ugly yeah. anymore. Yeah. Awesome. So thank you. That's why I'm here. I I I, I have a son to look for, not just me. John three sixteen. For God gave his own only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him in him shall not perish shall have everlasting life. Amen. 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 Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, give him testimony what God's done in your heart and life. Yeah, that's what it's all about, isn't it? So you know how to pray for these these, and uh, continue to pray for them as well. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Last week we uh, talked about how God works in us. And as God works in us, we work out, right? Uh, and we use the example of the farmer's field, how he plows the field, how he fertilizes, how he plants the seeds, how he waters it, how he does all that stuff. God is working in us to get the best harvest out of us. God sees the potential in you. Turn to somebody and say, God sees potential in you. Go ahead. God sees potential in you. God sees potential in you. God sees potential in you. God sees it. When we don't see it, when we don't understand it, we don't feel like, oh, we'll never mount anything. God sees potential. And he knows how to get that out of you. He knows what things that you need to walk through, those things that you need to experience, those things that you need to see and learn to get that potential out of you. God knows that. And God's works in our hearts and life. Then Paul goes on to write this crazy statement in verse 14. But before I read the statement, I want to just ask you a question. How many times do you complain throughout the day? Ten. George has ten. Anybody else beat ten? Uh, uh, I see a hand there, a hand there. It's going once, going once. I should have been. Uh, it's Eleven. It's seven. To, uh, yeah. Well, Look in the Bible, see what the Bible says about complaining. Philippians 2, verse 14. Do everything, everything without complaining. complaining or grumbling, depending on your translation. Maybe you didn't hear that. Do everything, George, without complaining or grumbling or arguing. 
verse 15, so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in the world full of crooked, crooked and perverse people. Have you ever met someone who just likes to complain? Those people wear me down. They complain about everything. This, that, and the other thing. The glass is always half empty. Oh, no, we're never going to make it. They just complain. Those people, they just always complain about everything. And it's just stupid stuff like you don't have any control over that. How many people complained about the grass being wet today? Come on, Sally. Come on. What's the big deal about complaining? Everyone does it. Isn't that how we kind of phrase it? Everyone complains about something. We just kind of write it off as it's okay. But God's word says, oh, wait a minute. It is a big deal. A couple weeks ago, we, we learned that we're supposed to have the attitude of Christ. Have the same attitude as Jesus Christ. Verse 5. I don't remember one time throughout the whole Bible that Jesus complained. I don't remember one verse. Anybody got a verse where Jesus complained? Even when the disciples had little faith, he said, oh, you guys have little faith. He just called it truth, truth. He didn't complain when Satan took him up to the mountain and tested him after praying for 40 days and 40 nights. He didn't complain when Judas betrayed him or Peter denied him. He didn't complain when the disciples didn't get it so many times. How many times did he tell them, hey, I'm going to die. I'm going to the cross. This is going to happen. He didn't complain. He didn't complain, not once. And Paul is writing Philippians to the church at Philippi, and he writes to us as well as our church, and he says, do everything without grumbling or complaining. There must have been something going on within the church that Paul had to remind them not to do that. This is one of those sermons, as I started into it this week, I'm like, I don't know if anybody's grumbling or complaining. I don't know if anybody's arguing. I haven't heard anybody complaining about whatever. So it's like, maybe this doesn't apply to us, God. Maybe I got the wrong sermon this week. But maybe not. Maybe we need to get better at that. Maybe we complain in different ways and we write it off as, oh, that's human nature. But God says, don't. Don't do that. I don't know about you, but a two-year-old is my best example. A two-year-old that's tired is my best example of a whining and complaining person, <laughs> right? I, a three-year-old. Three, I see that hand. Thank you. I won't mention any names, but thank you. A three-year-old is better than a two-year-old. There you go. Uh, we, you know, I was good at whining and complaining. I don't want to make my bed, Mom. I don't want to do my homework. I don't want to do the dishes. I don't want to. And we complain. How come? And before long, we start to compare ourselves with our brothers and sisters or our neighbors. How come he gets to stay up to 10 o'clock and I have to go to bed at 930? How come she gets to do that? And how come he gets more ice cream than I got? He got three scoops and I only got two scoops. How come? And we complain and my, my brother always got more, it seemed like. And I complained. He was older. And of course, when I complained and picked on him and he picked on me, it turned into a fight and we were on it until we got about 15 or 14, 15 years old, and I got strong enough to beat him. And then somehow we stopped fighting. I don't know how or why. Maybe we just grew up and got mature. Maybe we started to focus on what we needed, not so much what they were doing, but what we needed to take care of in our own lives as well. I hope it was just that we got mature. Paul writes in Romans 14, accept other believers who are weaker in faith. Don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's right to eat meat, but the other one believes it's insensitive to only, it's only uh, to eat vegetables. Eating meat or eating vegetables, Paul was writing to the church at Rome and, and explained to them, it's okay, if you want to eat just meat, go ahead. If you want to eat just vegetables, all right. It's not a sin issue, it's a preference. It's just a preference. It's okay. You can do either one. Later on, he talks about you can worship on Saturday or you can worship on Sunday. It's not a right and wrong. It, it's like our modern day uh, debate sometimes we have. It, it's all right to sing choruses. It's all right to sing hymns. It's not a right or wrong. It's a preference. It's what you like or what you enjoy. But there are sin issues 
breaking God's law, we know is a sin issue. Now, that's a different story. Uh, and then really, there's no argument when it comes to sin issues, is there? You just pull out the Bible, and you open it up, and you start reading God's word. And truth speaks. It shows us right and wrong. There's no argument. The argument's over. The word of truth speaks, and we need to obey it and follow through with it. End of argument, end of discussion. Paul says, do everything without grumbling and arguing. It really kind of points back to what we learned a couple weeks ago in verse 3 and 5, where it says that we are to love one another. Work together, one mind, one purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress the other person. Be humble, thinking of others better than yourself. Don't look out for your own interests, but the interests of others. You must have the attitude of Christ. You know how to finish an argument? Just start loving somebody. Just start being humble. Just start thinking about their needs over your needs. Man, that'll finish an argument in a hurry, won't it? When we start humbling and thinking of others, we'll stop complaining. And we start looking out for their interests, not just our own interests. It'll end the argument. When we take on the attitude of Christ, what would Jesus do? How would he do? We see throughout the New Testament, there's many that came up to Jesus and challenged him. The Pharisees were great at this. They'd come and challenge Jesus and try to trick him in the law and try to get him to stumble and try to get him to misquote something. And Jesus just challenged them back by speaking the truth, quoting scripture, pointing back to the Old Testament and the law of Moses said and, and showing them and asking them questions. You know, Jesus could have called 10,000 angels and zapped them all dead, right? Yep. Could have just finished it, but he didn't do that. There's the attitude that we're to have, to love and encourage one another. And so about this arguing and complaining, why? Why should we do that? Well, Paul helps us in verse 15, so that you might become blameless and pure. Live clean lives. So that you might be a good example. Children of God without fault in this warped and corrupt generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Complaining is not a characteristic of God. And we are to be God's children. We're to reflect his characteristics in our lives. And complaining and grumbling and arguing is not one of those characteristics. A blameless uh, in ourselves and harmless to others. Complaining will ruin your testimony. It will ruin your witness in the community and those around you. Complaining will ruin your witness of Jesus. Complaining will ruin your testimony. There's nothing like those three people that just shared their testimony, how they used to be and how they are now. Change lives. Change lives. They have a testimony. We all have a testimony. And complaining will ruin our testimony. Complaining will ruin our unity of the faith as well. Complaining is a sign of dis disobedience or discontentment. And oftentimes, we don't think of it like this, but I want to just challenge you just for a minute. When we complain, we really are discontent with God. Think about it just for a moment. We don't see it like that. We don't want to talk about it like that. But just think about it. When we express our disbelief and our displeasure, we're really pointing it at God. It's his fault, right? It's his fault that the grass was wet this morning, right? We wouldn't say that out loud, but that's what we're saying. Isn't that what we're really saying? We complain. We like to blame God, God for that very thing. Paul helps us so many times throughout the New Testament. Ephesians, he says it like this, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, all types of evil behavior. Instead, I love it when Paul says, don't do this, but do this. So we say, well, what are we supposed to do? Well, verse 32, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as Christ through Jesus forgave you. Jude 1, 16 says, these people were grumbling and complaining living only to satisfy their own desire. These people, Jude writes, these people. I don't want to be these people. Matter of fact, I don't want to be around these people. 
that he's referring to. It goes back to our witness. When we complain and, and grumble, others won't want to be around us as, as, as well. And if others don't want to be around us, how are we going to share Jesus with them? If we're complaining and arguing and grumbling the whole time, I don't want to be these people. Think about it. Moses and Aaron are leading the children of Israel to the promised land. It wasn't just days out of Egypt. What did they start to do? Complain. Why? Why did you bring us out here to die? Where are we going to have water? How, how are we going to get enough water for everyone? Uh, we're hungry. We want something to eat. How are we going to feed this 2.3 million people that are following you out of Egypt? Uh, and, and we want meat as well, right? And they complain. Now, who was Moses and Aaron? They were God-chosen ones. Moses and Aaron was God's mouthpiece. What They were leading them by God's direction. I love this verse. Numbers 14. Then the whole community began to weep out loud, and they cried out all night, and their voices rose up, rose up with a great chorus, protesting against Moses and Aaron. If only we've died in Egypt. Instead of here in the wilderness, they complained. All night long, they whined and complained about Moses and Aaron leading them out of slavery. Only if we would have stayed there, we could have had our vegetable garden, they said. Only there, we could have ate our melons and our leeks and our peppers. Only if you would have left us there in slavery. Only if. By complaining against Moses and Aaron, they're really complaining against God. Because Moses and Aaron was God's mouthpiece. God appointed one. No difference than when we complain about our spouse. I'm just going to get quiet in here. Uh-oh. Or complain about our kids, or our boss, or our neighbor, or the government. I, you could just go on and on. In reality, we're complaining about God, aren't we? Aren't we really just saying that it, it's God's fault? Uh, just think about it. God, you made me marry this woman. You, you made me, right? It's God, it's your fault that she has these characteristics. Or we complain about our kids. Man, he's got a temper. He's just like his parents. Or this or that. Or, or his kids. You complain about your parents. They have a curfew. I have to be in when the street lights go on. That's what it used to be. Really, we're complaining about God. We complain. Our boss, our neighbor, have you read the new law? Didn't we sing a song earlier, God, you reign? Isn't God in control? Do I like all the things that are happening to me? No. Am I going to complain about it? Mm -mm. Am I going to stand up? Uh-huh. Am I going to pray? Uh-huh. Am I going to do it in love? Uh-huh. In love. So why? Why not complain? So we might live blameless, spotless lives. So no one can criticize us. No one will have reason to say, oh, they're just complaining. No, that we would live the way God's called us to live. So that our light would shine in this world that we live in, this crooked world that we live in. My best example of the, this world thing was sometimes we say we get caught up in the world. Uh, we have to act like the world, smell like the world, talk like the world, do what the world says. When we're in the Navy, we've got to look like a sailor and do those things or whatever. My best example is a fish swimming in salt water. A shark that swims in salt water his whole life drinks in salt water, breathes salt water, lives in salt water, never gets out of salt water, but you know what? When you eat shark, it doesn't taste salty. Huh, how can that be? It's the same thing with us. Even though we live in a crooked world, even though that we live in this world and we hear all this stuff in this world, we don't have to look, act, or live like the world. We're called to be different, set free from that. What are we supposed to do? 
let our light shine for Jesus. Because of Christ working in us, we can work out. Because of God working in us and the Holy Spirit coaching us and guiding us and helping us, we can shine our light. We can shine our light bright. Just like the moon reflects the sun, we are to reflect the image of God in our lives, living pure and innocent lives. Are we perfect like Olivia said? Uh Uh-uh. But that's our aim. That's our goal. That's what we want to be. So we can shine bright in this world. So we can shine the love of Jesus into, so we can reflect the image of God. So our heavenly father will be glorified. Jesus said it like this in Matthew, you are the light of the world. A a city set on a hilltop cannot be hidden, nor can a lamp be put underneath a basket. Instead, a lamp is to be placed on a stand where it gives off light for everyone in the house to see. In the same way, let your good deeds shine. Let your good deeds shine for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father. Not me, not you, but our heavenly father. That they may see our good deeds and that God would be glorified, that they're the lives, that they would become thirsty for the things of God. People are watching our lives, like it or not. I was at the hardware store the other day and the guy told me, he just says, uh, oh, you're, you're the pastor of that church over there that's building that new building. I says, uh-huh. He says, I listen to your sermon every Sunday morning. I said, you do? You watch this on Facebook? He says, no, I live in the neighborhood across the street, and I can sit on my back deck and listen. So welcome to our church. I didn't even get his name. People see our lives. A lighthouse, we know what a lighthouse is for, right? A lighthouse is out there on the edge of the land, pointing out where the rocks are at, where the channels are at, where the ship should go, keeping the ship safe. We're to be the lighthouse. We're to shine bright, helping people in this dangerous world that we live in, shining our light so all can see that our Heavenly Father might be glorified so we can shine in this dark world as we live blameless and pure lives as children of God not complaining, without grumbling, or without arguing in everything we do, that our lives would shine bright, that God would be glorified. Paul goes on in verse 16, chapter 2, hold firm to the word of God, to the word of life. Hold firm. Don't you just love it how Paul walks us through, don't do this, don't do this, but here's how to do it. Hold firm to the word of God. Grab hold of the word of God. I love it, Olivia, that she gets up, she does her devotions in the morning, and she reads the Word of God. What a way to start your day. What a way to set a pattern for your day. Paul goes on so we can rejoice. He's poured out as an offering, as a sacrifice to God, giving his life to him. And all he wants to do is share his joy with all of them. Paul writes from prison, remember? He's talking about joy and pouring his life out. We have so much forward to look forward to. Our time on earth is short. A little bit of suffering, these few years of trials and pain, and then heaven, the joy of heaven. Not only when we get there, but we can experience it today because we have something to look forward to. We have the promise of the word of God. Paul sees his suffering as a doorway into a deeper relationship with Jesus. He says he's comparing his set offering sacrifices, being poured out as a drink offering, giving ourselves completely, pouring ourselves out as a living sacrifice, not holding back, being faithful in service and offering ourselves to God. And we do that through the Word of God. As we read the Word of God, as God works in our lives, we work out. We look forward to the return of Christ, the joy of serving him, letting your light shine that our Heavenly Father would be glorified. How are you doing? How are you doing when it comes to complaining and grumbling and arguing? Is your light shining bright or is it pretty dim because of all the arguing and complaining that's going on in your life? We're called to live blameless, innocent lives, children of God in this world. And we're to do it without complaining or grumbling or arguing as children of God. Let's bow our heads for a second.
Father, forgive us for the times that we complained, grumbled. About our spouses, about our family, about our boss, about the government, about the dew on the grass. Forgive us, Father. Forgive us. Father, forgive us for those times that we argued over stuff. The color of the carpet. Forgive us, Father. Father, we want to shine bright. Blameless lives as children of God. And we get to start fresh today. We get to start fresh right now. So, Father, I pray that we would pour our lives out to you as an offering. We would set aside our stuff that you would be honored and glorified. You are an awesome God and you reign. Help us to remember that every day. Thank you, Father, for your love and your grace. Thank you, Father, for all that you provide. Thank you that you're an awesome God and that you love us so very much. quietness of the moment as you ask God to forgive you for complaining or grumbling or arguing if God lays someone on your heart for a situation will you just go to that person and say hey I'm sorry we argued about this I'm sorry I complained about would you just be obedient to God and listen to a still small voice right now Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit that speaks to our hearts. I pray that you'd speak to us today in the days ahead. Thank you, Father. Father, thank you for the lives that got to share their testimony this morning, and we get to baptize them in just a minute. I pray that you'd protect them, that you'd build a hedge of protection around them. We know that Satan's going to come after them because they're making this declaration. I pray, Father, that you would be with them uh, and protect them from the evil one. And that we as a church, we would pray for them, for Autumn and Olivia and Kristen. Father, that we would lift them up before you this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being with us at uh, Waterbleed for Methodist Church Backyard Worship. We'll be outside next week if the weather holds.